You're back at the Sacred Birth Circle. Today's guest is someone who is so inspiring, who has brought so much change in honor of the babies that she has lost and all our babies gone too soon. She will be discussing the Rainbow Clinic, which we help bring to New York City, and all the efforts that we are working on through Push for Empowered Pregnancy. Please share this episode so we can reach more families. Welcome to the Sacred Birth Circle. I'm Anna Vic. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. My guest is actually somebody that I work very closely with, I will say on a regular basis. I like to call her boss, yeah. boss lady, boss mama. She is doing so many great things for the world in honor of her children as well as all ours. Everything we do at Push for Empowered Pregnancy is out of love and passion. Uh, we, of course, are volunteers, so everything is just out of our own time, money, and energy. And so I just want to thank her first and foremost for everything she's contributed in the last year and a half of our existence. And I think she's just given me so much hope and excitement. And that's why this episode here today, we are dedicating to our children and the change that they're making in the world. So I want to let her introduce herself and then we'll hear a little bit about her story and why she is in this community and what she's doing to help other families. Faye, go ahead. Hi, boss here. Hi, everybody. I'm Fernanda Sheridan. I now part of this lost community, which nobody wants to be part of, but it's a beautiful community. We help each other a lot. And I'm glad to met to have met friends through through this um, path. I had a stillbirth like Anna. I first lost my baby boy George at five months. Then I, he had a genetic abnormality, and I think that was easier to accept than to avoid any complications. We did IVF, so I could test the embryos beforehand. That's when we implanted Natalie, and she was uh, stillborn at 38 weeks, which is hard, heartbreaking. I, then, I think I feel like then I, I grieve for both of them together. Uh, now we are here trying to educate moms and trying to make change among with the clinicians and researchers and help improve the prenatal care where we know already with the techniques that we have and the, um, the availability of technology and human power, we can already, we can already prevent some. Um, after I had my second loss, Natalie, I, I couldn't uh, think about getting pregnant, getting pregnant again. I was very afraid of that happening uh, another time. So I started going through a lot of OBGYN throughout Manhattan and asked them, what are the chances of it happening? And nobody had a clear answer. Nobody would tell me what exactly happened. And that's when I obsessively, for a, for a few months, I started Googling all about stillbirth and the chance and went to PubMed and reading research when I found uh, Professor Hiesel's research. And then I found Tommy's and the Rainbow Clinic that they have at Manchester, UK. I saw the numbers at the time was out of 900 births. They had had just one stillbirth in a high risk population. And that's what I want to go to have my pregnancy. And of course that didn't happen. It, it's not feasible to leave everything and move to another country. So the idea, I had the idea, but I never had the guts, I think, to follow through. And then at one point, my husband just sat down and said, if you don't do it, nobody will. Just, just go ahead and do the call. And that's how it all started. So we spoke to, to the Rainbow Clinic director and, and mastermind behind it at, in UK. And then we connected to the chief of the OBGYN and president of MFM at Mount Sinai. And we finally were able to, to start the Rainbow Clinic in New York. And it's been a year, almost a year. And they've been seeing a lot of um, lost parents and helping them bring safe um, a baby. That's incredible. I think that's amazing. And I know you um, 
obviously you saw the value of this program and what they're doing. And all of us, I think, probably ended up looking at that when we were pregnant after loss, but not ever imagining there was any way to bring it here. Uh, our system is obviously quite different from the UK and everything just costs a lot of money and no one even thinks like we can start a clinic and that is just so amazing and I think it's lovely how your husband backed you up with that crazy idea which <laughs> I know a lot of us come up with wonderful big ideas and then we get discouraged because there's a lot of steps involved and a lot of you know finance and everything but with you guys proposing it coming to push and all of the families we are the same we all think like sure we can do it anything's possible especially for our babies why not you know yeah. why not just try and why don't you share a little bit more like how the clinic is helping families because not everybody knows what a rainbow clinic does and if you're pregnant after loss you might want to look into that as well if you're in the area of new york city you can be a patient but if you're not there we also have a training program that your provider can take so they can be a little bit more sensitive to you, the emotional you know challenges you're going to face with your pregnancy also come from studies so i'm not just telling from experience but pregnancy after loss have um, an impact in the body and the mental that needs to be addressed First of all, um, the ha the highest risk of having another stillbirth if had had a, a stillbirth before, so it's five times more the chance. And if you had something, some problem in the placenta, it's probably going to repeat itself. Or if you have some problem circulation, it's probably going to repeat itself. So it's very important to dig deeper to find out the cause. So that's what the Rainbow Clinic is going to do. That's the first step. Second is mentally and emotionally is very hard on a, on a on a person you you're gonna suffer so much anxiety and depression and thinking you have a ticking bomb inside your body and that per se can lead to a poor outcome for the next uh, pregnancy also even the stillbirth if it doesn't bring to another stillbirth it can bring um problems with fetal growth restriction, it can bring other um, bad outcomes that are not, it is not extreme as a stillbirth, uh, but it's poor, it's poor outcome. So seeing all those studies, we, we think that Rainbow Clinic is being best for the care after loss. And in UK, it's proven to work so they have 28 clinics, I think, throughout UK now. And it started in 2013, so not even 10 years ago. And that's what we want to see in New York. So what Mount Sinai is doing? So they hired three more MFMs. They have a mental health supporter there only for the, the Rainbow Clinic. They have a nutritionist and they have more staff and a, a phone line only for the Rainbow Clinic. That going to help. Uh, the physicians to have more time to spend with their with the patients so it can decrease anxiety they can talk about what they're seeing in the ultrasound they can explain things in pregnancy and try to calm down the moms and they're going to be more available for um, the moms for whenever they need if they're feeling uneasy about the pregnancy at any moment some moms feel more anxiety going see to more ultrasounds and some prefer going and they feel better coming up going to more ultrasounds or tests or seeing their caregiver so they're um they are healthcare providers so um the important is that the clinicians are going to partner up with the patients and they're going to uh, they're going to draw their birth plan and that's going to calm down that calms down the patients a lot we had good feedbacks. We know that also Mount Sinai is uh, seeing patients from the tri-state area, not only New York. And we think they have capacity, the capacity to see double what they've seen now. I think the care level has to be super specialized, which it is at the clinic for pregnancy after loss. I remember when I lost Owen that I didn't know the cause of death. And my next provider, even though he was amazing and wonderful and I trusted him fully, 
they didn't go in to try to find out the cause of death with me, which I was kind of like, isn't that something you might want to know? Because you might want to tailor what's happening with my care this time around. And it was just not part of what they did. Which is absurd. Like you need to try. Most of the, the, the findings are better to be done when you have the loss. And that's another thing that needs to be educated the all the, the population needs to be educated, the physician needs to be educated to try to get that information at the time of the loss and encourage educate uh, very gently and sensitive in a sensitive manner to do autopsies and other findings to help for another pregnancy. But if that was not done, the, the Rainbow Clinic needs to get collect as much information they can to help you through uh, the next pregnancy. And it's important to be in the beginning of the pregnancy. So the chance that they have to do something, it's preconception or right after you find out you're pregnant. Right, and they do also take you for the preconception appointment, right? You don't have to be pregnant yet. No, you don't have to be pregnant yet. Yeah, and I think that's something actually a good tip for anyone looking to be pregnant, even if you're not a lost parent is find the right provider, you know, do those preconception appointments and make sure you feel like a good connection, that they're listening to you and that you feel like you would be able to go through the whole process, you know, because you never know what might come about in your pregnancy. And if you don't feel comfortable, that's not a good relationship from the get-go. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you need to be comfortable. I need to feel reassured. <clears throat> and they need to be partnered with you and it, it, it already is going to be harder. You can only imagine if you are not in a, in a clinic that doesn't understand you. So all the sensitivity of care, of uh, communication was a training done by us, lost mom, with uh, questions that we sent out to the lost community and had the feedback of what happened to them that they would like to avoid. And we made it PowerPoint. We made um, we hired actors to do the do's and don'ts that physician could really visualize and internalize what they shouldn't say and or should uh, shouldn't act like that. Can you go into that a little bit because I know not everyone is going to ever take that course, and I think that's very important for any providers listening to hear some of this as far as tips is what you should or shouldn't say. I know for my pregnancy after loss, I really wanted Owen acknowledged and some people are different about that. So you should have a conversation with the patient, like how would you like me to refer to your previous pregnancy and your child, what was your child's name and would you like me to use it and that sort of thing. What other tips would you give providers? Because I do think that that can add a lot to your emotional distress going in. I'll say for myself as well, uh, ultrasounds are very triggering for a parent after loss, many of us uh, found out horrible news through ultrasound. So when I had ultrasounds and they were very quiet throughout the process, that was really hard for me. I like, I want conversation. I want like a little more dialogue. Like it's, it's looking good so far, you know, that sort of thing. What yeah. do you recommend? Yeah, so silence is a terrible thing for um, a pregnant after loss. They wanna end communication and sensitivities. We don't ask, a parent after loss if they're if it is their first pregnancy um so we were in a conference in utah the international stillbirth alliance and then there was a, pa a panel with two ob ob OBGYNs that lost their kids as well and they were saying the same like, bring the name up don't ask if it's the first pregnancy if the ultrasound is triggering which is 99 percent it's going to be you don't take the vitals before, you take the vitals after. First, you do like the mom wants just to see their baby, just to make sure that the heartbeat is, is fine and everything's fine. And then you do the mom's vitals because you will change. Uh, the blood pressure might go very high in the beginning. And don't push back when they want to do more appointments. There's so many little tips that are very important. And we made it very clear in a manner that a person can really learn and incorporate in their daily basis practice. Also just making sure that the provider knows like if we are worried about movement, especially like those sort of things should always be taken very seriously. But for a parent after loss, like anything we notice is different. 
you should really take that into account. And I know that that's part of the problem with stillbirths is that a lot of times patients are not being listened to. So again, for parenting or pregnancy after loss, as well as a normal pregnancy, I think that's like the number one, you know, making the parent feel heard and then acting on those concerns. And bringing the, uh, and bringing the previous pregnancy along. So it's a combination of the two pregnancies. So we are not forgetting the other baby that's not here among us. It's not a, the rainbow baby or the baby after loss is not a replacement. So, and we need to understand that some dates are gonna be triggering because it might be the date that you lost um, that stillborn and you're pregnant again and you're pregnant again during that date. So you will have, it will be harder for you or is a six month out of your, of the, of your loss. So it's important for the providers to have that in their notes. Um, and make sure everything is going fine for the mom. Yeah, definitely. Can you share a little bit about the Rainbow Clinic and how having the Rainbow Clinic here now is actually going to improve prenatal care in general? I feel like, you know, it's a different standard of care and it's one that will have data attached to it. So, you know, once we start to see the mothers come through this new clinic with outcomes that we hope to be much better because of the care, then that can be used, right, for future clinics to look at. Yeah, so, uh, so our goal, major, ideally, it would be to uh, bring the, the standard of care to the top of as a, as a rainbow clinic. So that becomes the standard of care. So nobody needs to go through a loss to go to have a better um, prenatal care. So the UK Rainbow Clinic is co uh, collective data. They are doing a hub now, getting together the data from all Rainbow Clinic and writing papers and studying. So Mount Sinai is part of that hub. So they're joining the, the study for um, the outcomes and um, what are they going, the, the mother, parents are going through. Also, they have a questionnaire for feedback. So we hear what are the parents going through in the Rainbow Clinic here, as well as there, they, they do the same. So that's that's the best way to improve. And like you mentioned at the beginning, if this population would normally have a higher incidence of stillbirth, then we can hopefully see that we're having better outcomes. It's kind of proof of the kind of care that is being given is, you know, what we should be giving everybody, right? Exactly. Exactly. And also as New York City has a very high number of stillbirths, which it was 900. I don't know what it is this year with COVID. But... Yeah. Oh yeah. COVID changed the data that a little bit, um, but still considering 900 as what we have from CDC so far. And yeah, so, I mean, that alone is the reason I think not only because we were able to have Dr. Stone, who we would have given anything to have someone like yeah. her be the lead, but she's in a community where is a very high rate. So we're going to see a very, hopefully, you know, great change. And there's definitely a lot of sadly patients that will be able to use the clinic who want to go there. Exactly. So Dr. Stone was um, someone, it was someone recommended in all loss community. Whenever you ask, who do I go to after a loss? I've heard like 20 times, Dr. Stone, Dr. Stone, Dr. Stone. And then when he found Push, two of the, the founders were seeing Dr. Stone and had their rainbow baby with, with her. So she was already doing a very empathetic care different that was seen in other clinics. So I think she was the perfect person to, uh, to um, be the leader on that. Mm -hmm. And also with her influence with the Society of Fetal Medicine, I mean, we hope that others will see like this is an important area and obviously she's interested and hopefully everyone else will be as well. And, and with still prevention, finally getting awareness, you know, we're going to get a lot more conversation around this. Right, right, exactly. I wanted to share just a moment about this um, stillbirth prevention day that we had. A national day was proclaimed this week in Washington, D.C. and a lot of the push family was there. I call us a family. Uh, we were very proud to represent our children and a lot of the others that couldn't be there. Uh, we think of all your babies all the time and, you know, they really should be here. I think over half of stillbirths are preventable. So 
with our voices, uh, speaking for our children and all the others that aren't here, I think we are gonna make a great change. Um, and that was actually a really nice uh, event. It was last minute put together, but the fact that we were able to say as a nation that stillbirths should be prevented, it's a big thing because I think up until now, people just assume that it just happens. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. And obviously we're finding there is a lot of causes and ways to prevent. What did wow. you think about that, Faye? I know you didn't get to be there and you had the FOMO, but you're coming hopefully to DC next month. Yeah, I think I am. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what I, it, it was beautiful to see the uh, webinars or the seminars actually at um, the Stillbirth Alliance um, getting together the best researchers in the world and, and hearing from them what they've done in other countries that are already decreased for 20 to 30 or 20 or 30 percent of the stillbirth rate in Australia is a big one that did it so um, UK uh, decreased Scotland together and Norway and Sweden have better um, outcomes for stillbirth so we know that if you do a few things you can help prevent a lot of stillbirths, especially in the uh, le last tri trimester. Right, and that's, you're speaking to the point that our stillbirth rate has not decreased in very many decades, and yet we are a high-income country with the highest um, cost for medical care and insurance, and yet we are doing so poorly, you know, and it's not because there isn't information or science available, we're just not implementing it. We're just not implementing, exactly. What would you say to a parent after loss? Like, what are some tips? Let's help some families here that may not be able to go to the New York City Clinic, but um, what has helped you? I know you've experienced pregnancy through other means, but you obviously went through the rainbow baby experience. How did you get to the end? Oh my God. What I would say is first, find a provider that you think is going to be empathetic. Or, or you feel that empathy right away, or you feel that connection. If you don't like the first, you go to the second. First, browse around, like try to find the clinician that you think is gonna hold your hand and then express yourself. Even if you need to write down so you don't forget, you go to the appointment with things written down, like uh, saying that I am gonna be anxious that date. I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna need help the, um, at that point or I prefer to do the ultrasound before the vitals, or I, I wanted to communicate with me every time, like tell them what they, uh, what you wanna hear from there. Sometimes they don't know, they don't know because they were not educated. They've never been to the, through that. So just let them know. And then, so you need to find someone that's gonna hear you and try to accommodate your needs, your unique needs uh, for a pregnancy after loss. Those are good tips. I think also what's important is to remember that, you know, you are the authority on your body. And unfortunately, after loss, we kind of feel like we can't trust ourselves, maybe, and we go to those machines more and everything, but still try whatever you can, you know, to get in touch with how your baby's feeling and how your body's feeling and communicate. Yeah, communicate and make sure you're being heard. Pay attention of the baby's movement. Ask your provider. What do you think about baby movement? So they need to be on board that fetal movements matter. Uh, then you need to get to know your baby. So that's one of the, the most important because you can feel and that's the well-being of your baby. That's the way he co communicates with you through their movement. So if you had a baby in your arm and he's acting weird, he would go to the pediatrician or the ER. The same is the baby's in your tummy and you feel like something is not right. We know better. You just push for them to listen and always say, do you want to be responsible for this if something goes wrong? So you you throw them some weight. So it's not only on you. If you can bring someone, it's always good to have someone to advocate for you. If you cannot, write down and try to, to put it out there. I agree with that because I would always have it even on my phone, you know, a little list of like what happened the last couple of days and what I want to make sure to ask them to do, what test I want, you know, because 
the first time, you know, before loss, you probably don't have the same amount of concerns and like what kind of tests. And then you start to learn all these things that, you know, we never talk about in normal pregnancies. And you're like, well, why don't I get tested for this? And maybe I should be taking as baby aspirin or whatever you might be thinking. And you can have those conversations with your doctor and see why they're not encouraging you to do it for your pregnancy. Or maybe they'll say, okay, yeah, sure. You can do that. Like I was obsessed with the idea of having blood clotting because of my stillbirth and I had a miscarriage and then another miscarriage. So I didn't know for sure if I had, you know, blood clotting disorders because they wouldn't test for that. So I said, well, I just want to take baby aspirin. I know it's not harmful for my baby. Can I do this? And my doctor at first was like, mm, I don't think you really need to, you know, but then I was just like, I really want to. So by the time I think he wanted me to get past the first trimester and then he was like, okay, we'll start letting you to take it. It doesn't do anything. Right. So I did that and I was just more comfortable. You know, I, you just have to keep speaking for yourself. Otherwise you're just going to be terrified at home, you know, not speaking out um, and you know anything you notice with your body you have to be strong and keep saying you know to your provider what's going on here so you can hopefully catch you know any issues that are coming about but I know it's hard because we feel the pressure on us especially as the one carrying the baby and then um, in any case the partner as well always I'm sure is just as freaked out about it but anything we can do to kind of gain some more control I think it helps a lot yeah Exactly. So why don't we ask our guests who are watching and listening if they are kind enough to help us with the Rainbow Clinic. We are actually trying to fund another year. So we agreed to um, fund for three years just to get this program going. And so we're on our mission to fund the second year right now. So they want you to tell them what we're doing and then I'll make sure to drop the link as well into our chat here. Um, and then if you guys would like to donate or you can make a page for your family too, you can do that as well. Exactly. So last year was the first year of the, the funding of the Rainbow Clinic, which they opened the doors last um, January. And now we are funding for the second year. So they hired other MFMs, the social work, the nutritionists, they're making sure that those doctors are going to have more time with the patients. So everything um, costs costs money. They think they're gonna be. They think or probably they're gonna be self sufficient after the third year. So their business plan was to get our help for the first three years. So we are in the second year, and we want to make sure that the Rainbow Clinic keep it door open for all the lost parents that can go there. Um, so we need help from for funding and any dollar counts so if you can if you have five dollars twenty five dollars everything helps us to keep the door open we have a tiny url.com slash rainbow clinic r and c have to be capitalized i believe in 2022 so i put that in there as well if you can have the link um, it's important for you to either donate to the overall group, or if you want to, you can do your own page. If you have a baby that you lost and you want to fundraise, and then you can share that on Facebook and Twitter and all over the place. So I have a page for Owen and I know Natalie and I believe George also has that page. So if you want to donate to our babies, our families, we would love to keep seeing the number increase. We are getting there. Uh, we do have a, about a month, a little bit over a month. Yeah. Um, go and we are very you know obviously hopeful that the community will support we know we all support all kinds of initiatives but for me like number one is to give everyone else a better experience of pregnancy so this means a lot to me personally I want to prevent anyone to have any kind of loss especially a parent who has already been through this they, they should have the best care possible so I think it's a beautiful way to honor Owen and all of our children so his birthday's coming. So this is his birthday fundraiser and you guys can do the same. You can fundraise for your own birthdays or uh, whatever the occasion is. I know people usually like to support you and they want to know where do you want them to donate to? And I think there's nothing better than to help improve care for others. Exactly. Exactly. So do you have any final thoughts, Faye? Anything else you want to share? What else is push going for? But we can definitely talk about the big push a little bit because that's our other big awareness event we have coming next month. Um, There's something that I would like to tell. There was um, 
a very good moment to have at the conference when one of the top researchers in US approached us and said, I want to collaborate with you and I want you guys to collaborate with me. There are not many people that care about stillbirth in, a, in this country. And I'm so glad for, for those that are because we didn't have a choice and they had and they chose to care about stillbirth and the research on it. And the fact that he came to us and said that they want, we want to work together meant a lot. And I think we can do a lot of things together. And he was proud to hear about the big push because we do need to bring attention to that silent crisis that was brought up by the Lancet, but no, nothing was done. So I think PUSH is a big organization with um, very, um, I'm not, I don't think it's angry is the right word, but very energetic months that want to make a change happen. So the march for uh, the big push in October 15 is going to mean a lot for this country. If you want to attend, that's the bigpushmarch.org and you can attend in DC, which is going to be where our, the most energy and people will be, but there'll be some satellite events and you can also just do it around your town. You can push an empty stroller, which is what we'll be doing and send photos through social media with uh, big push 2022 is the hashtag. That way you can be part of this event, which we do think that it's important that people visually see what it is we went through. We didn't get to take a child home. So we have an empty stroller. That's actually very symbolic for our families. And I took my stroller to DC this week when I was there and I pushed it a little bit to get some photos. And I was really, you know, obviously reliving my experience and you know, it's heartbreaking and people ask me like about the baby, where's the baby and stuff like that. And it's like, no, he didn't get to live. And I don't want anyone in the world to have to go through that and walk in our shoes. So we're going to do that together and a very powerful moment, October 15th for Pregnancy Infant Loss Awareness Day. So we hope you will join us and raise some awareness and you don't have to be a lost family. You can just be any human being who cares about others and providers as well. We have many that are coming who are working with us. Like Faye mentioned, there are a lot of people who really do care about this and who are doing a lot of research and work. And we know there's protocols, there's ways to prevent it. We just need everyone to agree and to start doing these things. So thank you guys so much for watching. I am so happy I got to speak to Faye. She's a busy woman and we need her to keep going back to work and talking to researchers and all the things that she's doing to try to really help us save babies. I think that's so important. It's, I it can't give us our children back. We will always miss our babies, but this is a way for their legacy to live on. And I'm so honored to fight with you, Faye. Me too, Anna. Me too, boss. <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> We're all boss ladies at this group and men. And thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. Please always reach out if you have any questions and you want to get involved. We love to have more change makers and all of our group is just run by all this love and passion and we're just doing all we can. So we love taking on new projects and some of them are very big, but we were like, figure it out. We're going to get the funds. We're going to figure out how to set it up because our children matter and every day counts with 65 babies dying every day. So we don't have a moment to wait. We are pushing really hard for the prevention bills that are out right now. We just went there to speak in person for all our families, uh, sending emails and anybody who's on those meetings as well, virtually. We thank you for your time. And I know it's hard, especially if you're the one who lost your child, but uh, we are the ones who know, you know, just how horrible this tragedy is. So we have to continue to do what we do. So yeah. thank you guys so much. Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm so honored to know Faye and see how she is changing the future of medicine as a mother of four who is loving her babies through all the work that she's doing. And I thank you guys all for supporting our efforts as well. Remember to share this episode on social media so you can help others in your circle grow their knowledge and have a better birth outcome. Remember that all the posts that we share and our episodes are not meant to be medical advice. We are simply trying to help you and inform you as you continue your pregnancy. 
but always remember that you should consult your provider if you have any questions or concerns. They're there to help you and they are available to you 24 seven, even if you have to go into the hospital or the ER. Again, follow us on social media to continue up to date with our next episodes and our posts. And feel free to connect with us in the DMs. If you have any questions, we would be happy to be there for you. You are not alone. This is your community. And we hope that you will continue to watch our future and past episodes to continue to add to your knowledge as we interview birth workers, providers, researchers, and even people who have experienced different births so that when you get to your birth, you'll be a little bit more informed and prepared for whatever comes your way. Goodbye for now.